Hello and welcome to Brooks TV. I'm Kieran Ahern. And I'm Helen Morton. Coming up in this week's episode. Oxford City Council are spending three million on the covered market refurbishments. Will this help tourism? We take a look at the new Blenheim Palace Green Trail initiative. And we see the effect Storm Dennis had on housing. Over the past year, mental health issues have spiked throughout the country. The recent death of Caroline Flack has once again put mental health in the limelight. They have also raised the questions of how social media impacts mental health. We now report to Tara Wood, who's going to tell us more. In 2018, there were 6,507 suicides registered in the UK, an average rate of 11.2 deaths per 100,000 population. On the 15th of February, Love Island's TV presenter Caroline Flack took her own life. She is one of many celebrities that have taken their lives when we least expect it. Reality TV series Love Island started in 2015 and since then there have been three suicides with members connected to the show. Following the death of Caroline Flack, an online petition named Caroline's Law has gone viral with nearly 500,000 signatures. The law seeks to have social media platforms make it illegal to abuse people online and make it a requirement for people creating social media accounts to provide an ID to prove who they are and their age. Uh, so the first thing to say is that um, I am passionate about how people can be supported to take responsibility around their physical and their mental well-being. Uh, I've recently moved back to university to study psychology and I'm a trustee of a mental health charity with specific responsibility around suicide prevention. So I attend a suicide prevention group where we take action within the local community to try and prevent suicide. I think that we all have mental health for a start. So, you know, I think I, I, I've alluded to the fact that we've had two suicides local to us recently. Um, they weren't personalities and celebrities. Um, I think it depends on some of the actions that we take as individuals and what's going on around us and that those things are multifaceted, so whether they're financial, there's grief involved, there's um, overwhelming issues that are just going on in your lives. I think, I, I think the, the biggest thing is it's just complex and, and complicated. Um, I think that media's always influenced people. Um, whether it's influencing them to raise a load of money for a good cause or whether on the other side it's um, you know, hounding people and saying things that maybe aren't helpful, especially if they're vulnerable at any particular time. So again, I, sort of, I, I oscillate between the two, that media can be increasingly powerful for very positive things. It can also create, um, create a monster, really. If you have been affected by this story, if you are feeling suicidal or struggling with difficult feelings, you can call the Samaritans on 116 123 or visit samaritans.org. This is Tara Wood, Brooks TV News. Breaking news, 12 towns in Italy are currently on coronavirus lockdown after at least 270 cases. The death toll has risen to seven casualties, making it the most infected country outside of Asia. The World Health Organization has urged the world to prepare for a potential pandemic. Despite this, the EU rules out closing the Schengen border. We sent our report to, to, we sent our report to investigate the coronavirus. Right, the outbreak that started in Wuhan province, mainline China, has spread to over 30 countries in the past two months. As of today, more than 75,000 people have been affected by the specific coronavirus. Despite this, the numbers are hopeful with over 16,000 recovered patients. In the UK, out of the 5,000 patients that were tested for coronavirus, only nine tested positive, eight of which have recovered successfully. We spoke to an advanced nurse practitioner to find out more about the virus and how we can prevent its spread. Coronavirus, um, all viruses, have been around for some time. Um, but the one we're talking about is the um, COVID-9. We're not 100% certain how this one spreads, but the similar ones to this, they spread by air droplets 
or by um, somebody who's um, been touching things who has the virus. So the symptoms are likely to be flu-like symptoms, so achy body, high temperatures, coughs, colds, those, that's where it will start. If you're concerned that you've been with somebody who's had the virus, then don't go to your GP, don't go to A&E and don't call an ambulance. Call 111 and they will sort you out, but stay in the house. Don't go shopping, don't whiz around on public transport, stay locally, phone 111 and they will talk you through it. Brooks University, following the Foreign and Commonwealth Office's advice, has decided to cancel all student work placement and travel to China. An Oxford Brooks University spokesperson said, The welfare of its staff and students is our highest priority. Our campuses remain open as usual and we will continue to monitor the situation carefully. That was the latest update on the coronavirus. Maria Galindo, Brooks TV. Now on local news, the covered market, one of Oxford's most iconic landmarks, is getting a new makeover. Laura Boyer reports. With covered market being one of the most popular tourist attractions in Oxford, after many years, Oxford City Council has agreed the final 1.8 million investment to complete different works on their route. Covered Market is one of Oxford's most popular and oldest markets, with tourist spots around Oxford such as Covered Market bringing in an estimated 16,000 tourists a day. This is around 9 million a year. An estimate by Mary Clarkson, an executive board member for Culture and City in 2019 says, 831 million was thought to have been driven into the city economy by visitors. At the moment, you know, the weather's awful, so it's, it's not as pleasant as it could be. Um, we do still get a lot of tourists in the markets who buy, you know, from the uh, coffee shops and the restaurants. And stuff like that. I think the covered market's got to be renovated and valued. It's a gem in the city of Oxford and it's irreplaceable once it's gone, it's gone. Um, but I do think the council need to consult closely with all the traders and see what their views are and what they actually require. Councillor Mary Clarkson, executive board member for Culture and City Centre said, Oxford City Council is the custodian of almost 250-year-old Oxford Covered Market. We take that responsibility seriously and we are investing 3.1 million to refurbish the internal space and ensure the roof will last generations. We really hope this investment, which is seen as important to many people in Oxford, will be worth it in the long run. This is Laura Boya, Brooks TV News. Well, I can't wait to see how that looks. Yes, definitely. And now, from one historic landmark to another, we travel across Oxford to the historical home of Winston Churchill. Our reporter Adam Jovic finds out more. Blenheim Palace has now introduced a new green travel rewards scheme, offering half-price tickets to guests visiting the palace by public transport. The 50% ticket discount was created to help conserve the palace building for future generations by removing the volume of cars commuting and parking on site. The 300 year old World Heritage Site plans to keep the green initiative until March 21st. The ways they encourage people to travel include bikes, public transport and fully electric cars. Cutting its usual entry fee down from £24 to 12 the palace hopes to reduce the amount of carbon emissions to help protect its own architecture and to conserve the appropriately named Pleasure Gardens. Jacqueline Gibson, Blenheim Palace environmental advisor, has said, Our aim is to be leading the way when it comes to green issues among the UK visitor attractions. We have seen steady growth in the visitors making use of public transport links, cycling or simply walking over the recent years. But what did those visiting the palace that day actually think of the changes this month? I think if you advertised it sort of in the wider environment, sort of London and places like that, then I think people would. But I think if you don't, then people will arrive by car and then they'll realise that they could have done it a different way. No, definitely for cyclists. More for people that are probably in wheelchairs and that, so yeah, it'd be good. With another effort made to help preserve green spaces around Oxfordshire's countryside, Blenheim Palace stands tall as one of the trademarks of Oxford's beauty throughout its history and its environment. Adam Jovic, Brooks TV News. Just a few days after Storm Dennis has finally left the UK, weather experts say there is a chance of snow falling in Oxford this week. Temperature, temperatures are expected to fall a couple of degrees lower, however chances of snow settling are still pretty low. 
We report now to Greg Bright to tell us about the effects of Storm Dennis. This footpath outside of Oxford would usually be filled with dog walkers and their pets, but today the dogs would have to adopt more of a paddle. This is the effect of the 13th named storm to hit Europe in this windstorm season. Storm Dennis has broken records and properties. Reaching speeds of up to 140 miles per hour, impacting countries from the United States to the Netherlands. Its impact can be seen throughout Oxfordshire, with many commuters being stuck at home due to flooding on routes across roads. And what you are looking at now is a completely submerged stretch of train line. And for those lucky enough to not be affected by the flooding, this may be quite a common sight. Many trees have been derooted from the ground and fences have been blown over. Uh, last week sometime, um, I was in the middle of the night and I heard it fall over. It was a really, really loud bang and it was quite scary because I didn't know what it was. I didn't know if it was ours or next door neighbours, so it's quite worrying as to what we were meant to do with it being in a student house. We now speak to Callum Withers to help advise students on how to take action. So apart from the flooding, the second biggest uh, problem is the damage to properties. Um, with student houses, that can be anything from uh, debris rolling into um, your garden to fences being knocked down. Interestingly, with um, fences, you actually only have an easement on the left side, so that's not your responsibility because it's a shared property between you and the other tenant um, of the house next to yours. So you only have to um, contact your landlords when you've got problems with the right side of the fence. So basically, uh, for students in student properties, just read your contracts and know what property is yours and what you have to look for. As soon as you spot something, tell your landlords, basically. Although Storm Dennis has passed, there's still yet more to come, as Storm Ellen is set to hit the UK at some point this week, according to the Met Office. So hunker down, as it's not quite over yet. Greg Bright, Brooks TV News. That was a truly horrific storm. Yeah, it was. Um, that's it for this half, but still to come. We check out a classic mini exhibition in Templar Square to find out more on the history of the car. And in sport, we look into the yoga and vegan festival at the Oxford Academy. Hello and welcome back to Brooks TV. I'm joined now by Kieran Smith, a student from campus, to talk to us about his experience with the counselling services at Brooks University. Hi, Kieran. Hi. Um, how were you first made aware of the Brooks counselling service? So um, a girl I live with, she uses it and she told me about it. And then I did a little um, Google search and it all sort of stemmed from there, really, yeah. OK, was it easy to get access to that information? Um, it was probably a bit trickier than I would have liked. It had to be like um, an assessment phone call and a few emails bouncing back and forth, which seemed a little unnecessary, but it was relatively easy, yes. Yeah, OK. Uh, what does it actually entail? Like, explain the process from start to finish. Or so um, I just sent an email and then they send you a couple of questionnaires to fill out. So I did those questionnaires and then there's a phone call with someone from the service to, I guess, sort of assess you. And then you're giving an, an appointment time, turn up, and then yeah. Um, how long were these? How long were the sessions? If like with the counsellors? So it's an, it, um, I think it's pretty standard to be an hour long session. It's sort of five ten minutes leeway, depending on the person. Okay. Uh, what made you choose Brooks Counselling Service over an external professional assistance? So I think um, when it comes to counselling services, therapy services, these sort of things, they're not the cheapest thing in the world so as a student the fact that it was free was quite appealing so that was the main reason for choosing Brooks counselling. Yeah I can definitely relate to that one. Um, at which point did you decide to seek counselling? It was just more I wasn't very happy with how I was feeling all the time so I thought I'll take a positive step try and do something about it rather than just sit there and let it happen so I tried to take a positive step. Right yeah that's good to hear. Um, do you know anyone else using the Brooks counselling service? Yeah, I have a few friends who are using it, yeah. Um, and how are they finding it? Is it working for them? Is it good? I think overall it's pretty positive. There's a few complaints about sort of waiting times and um, logistical things like that. But overall, I think it's a pretty positive thing for them, yeah. OK, that's good. Uh, do you think enough people are aware of the um, counselling services offered by university? I don't think so, no, because I certainly wouldn't have heard about it if it wasn't for my friend who'd used it before. And I've never seen anything 
around the university or got an email or anything like that. So I think it is not very well known. It should probably be advertised a little bit more. Okay, that's cool. Um, I actually, I actually had a friend that used their university counselling service, and the only reason I would have known about it was the same thing. So how do you think they could better promote the? Well, I think we all have um, student st student emails, so a few emails around there will probably help. Posters up around campus, this sort of thing, because like we're saying, it's quite um, an unknown service that's being offered, and I imagine there's quite a few people that could probably benefit from it. Do you think there are many people that are aware of it, but are too scared to take that step forward and go and get help? Probably, because I think it is quite a big step to take. Um, once you take the step, you realise it wasn't really much to worry about, but I think there is sort of a bit of a stigma around it, so people would rather keep it to themselves and not reach out for help, yeah. Is that why you think that people aren't seeking help that know about it, is because it's like the stigma around it? I think so. I think it's quite a scary thing to do to open yourself up to what is who is someone who is essentially a complete stranger. Okay, so um, how do you think you could get rid of the stigma around it? I think if it becomes more normalised and there are things advertising it or making people aware of it and it becomes a more normal part of university life, not something that has to be spoken about and has to be found, then that would probably go quite a long way to doing it. Um, so to anyone that's nervous about seeking help, how, what advice would you give them or how would you tell them to go about it? Um, so when I, what I was told when I first spoke to them was if I wanted to bring a friend I could, so they were more than happy to have someone come and support me. And the woman I spoke to, she was lovely and the sessions I had really helped me. So I'm not going to say it's an easy thing to do, but once you do do it, you have to remember that it's probably something you will be glad you did and not regret. Okay, well, on a lighter note, I heard you were studying sports coaching. Yeah. How are you finding that at uni? Yeah, very much enjoy it. A bit of um, unusual course, but yeah, very much enjoying it. Uh, what kind of career would you like to go into off the back of that? So a lot of people are on my course looking to go into PE teaching. It's not quite my thing. So I'm looking to actually go into coaching cricket probably is the the ideal plan. Okay, so you're a cricket player then? I am, yes. Um, have you played for any like local teams or county teams? or? Um, I played for university for a little bit up here, but I didn't really get on with them too well. So I play back home when I can. But So it helps with university because we're not here in the summer. So. Okay, my, my issue with the sports centre is the lack of like social sports teams. Have you found that at all? Yes, I see what you mean because... The, with the cricket, I'm not exactly the best player in the world, so I just wanted to have a little laugh, but it was taken a little bit too seriously, and it wasn't really what I was looking for. I wanted something more sort of low-key. Okay, would you say that sport has helped or benefited you in any way in terms of your mental health and the counselling service? I think there's a lot to be said for exercise. It's not a magical sort of remedy, but it will help you with your mental health. And I think probably the lack of sport I play at university may have something to do with that, yes. Um, I also see that you've, you've become vegan recently. Yep. How, what, how are you finding that? Um, it was easier than I thought it would be. I thought I'd really miss um, the ease of meat to begin with, but I'm feeling that I have like, more energy. It's not as expensive or as difficult as I thought it would be to take part in. So I'm enjoying it, yeah. Okay, so um, do you think that like little short answer do you think it's had a positive effect on how you're feeling certainly yeah so okay that's um that's good to hear it was nice having you on thank, thank you, you very much got time for a car factory at the heart of cowley's identity is ready to deliver the all electric vehicle to drivers as the new mini electric hits the market for the new era our reporter claudia omani went to check out the mini exhibition in templar square to learn more about the car's historic the past 60 years and it's a heritage that Oxford is proud of. This week members across Oxfordshire are showcasing their favourite cars at Templar Square shopping centre in Cowley. The exhibition was put in place for workers to come and reminisce and also let the younger generation learn more about the company. Beside the classic cars the public are also able to see the lineup of vehicles from across the decades. As the car manufacturer's latest model which doesn't hit the road for a couple of weeks the Mini Electric is on display.
I spoke to local resident and car enthusiast Tanya Field, whose husband has worked at the plant for 31 years and is one of the events organisers that, along with her family, has a passion for cars. So we've got 10 minis and they span, we've been building minis in this country for 61 years. We've got our earliest is a 1960 car and then we're right through to this brand new mini, mini electric, which is great to have. Mini is so intrinsic to Oxford, actually particularly this area Cowley, because we build the modern Mini. We built it here for 19 years and we used to build the classic Mini from 1959 to 1968. So while people love Minis generally, in this area it's something really special. So it's kind of twofold. We bring Minis and talk about Minis and celebrate that we build them here. But then also we get a lot of former workers come down and they meet each other here and they chat about the good old times at the factory. So it's just a lovely social event. This is the next sort of technology in cars um, and as we know from 2035 there's going to be banning you know the petrol, diesel and hybrids so we are then going to have to be electric. So to have that now in Oxford being built electric cars currently is really significant and really important that we've had that investment from BMW to allow Mini Electric to be developed and built here in Oxford. So it's quite critical really that we're at the beginning of that process now. 31 years ago I had a Mini and actually that's how I met my husband. He had a Mini too and all our friends had Minis. They were just cars you saw everywhere and nobody really thought of them as special back then. They were common, they were everywhere um, and they were just fun and they're classless and it's just like a kind of global love for Mini and um, that you can share with all your friends. So it's lovely that to have been part of it in Oxford because the very first classic Mini was built here in Oxford to be able to then share that globally is, is a real joy. The Cowley plant builds more than 1,000 cars each day and continues to have a much loved place in the Oxford community. Claudia Omani, Brooks TV. And now on to the sports section. The Yoga and Vegan Festival came to Oxford the past week. Our reporter Ada found out. A community of vegan yogis travel around the world to organise yoga and vegan festivals. We talked to some of the attendants at the Oxford Academy to find out more. It's really nice to see such a big community of vegans and people interested in vegan food and yoga. And hopefully people will get some more ideas about maybe food, ways to help other people turn vegan. Really good so far, yeah. Yeah, yeah, I love that. We've got here soon in the day, really. Yeah, <laughs> a bit of a late start. But yeah, no, it's been fantastic. Um, yeah. Obviously, I'm a granny. I have got grandchildren, but they're not with me, so I don't know how little ones would find it. But um, any adult can do it. I mean, if you can do it at my age, you can do it, <laughs> do it at any age. The festival takes on over 60 classes and has over 50 stalls. We talked to the events manager to find out more. I guess the main aim of uh, Biogific really is um, it's a beautiful, fun community day. We do these lovely pop-up uh, vegan and yoga festivals um, in nice venues all over the country. And the idea is to get lots of people through the door to give them a lovely taster sessions of different types of yoga, introduce them to lots of vegan products and food. Uh, so it's a very affordable way to uh, to get into yoga. And then if you just wanted to come and look at the vegan stalls and try the lovely vegan food we've got, then it was actually free just to come in and, and look around all the stalls. One of the main things that Yogific do is it's we're really all about giving and um, spreading sort of kindness and peace and happiness to the world. So we do a lot of charity work. As a result of the festival, they have raised around £6,000 for charities like the Oxford Mayor's Charity. Ada reporting, Brooks TV News. That's it for this episode. Thank you from us and the rest of the crew for watching. We'll be back again next week, but remember you can watch all of our previous extra episodes plus extra bits on the Oxford Brooks YouTube channel. Yes, and please don't hesitate to get in touch by emailing brookstv at brooks.ac.uk as we'd love to hear from you if you've got a news story you think we should be covering. See you next time. Goodbye.